All right, guys, well, with the release of Malignant this weekend, we now have 10 feature films by James Wan, and it's time to rank those bitches. James Wan is one of the greatest directors working today. I think that he is on the path of being on that horror director, Mount Rushmore, but he also shows a lot of promise in action movies as well. He's done Fast and Furious movies, done Aquaman, even one of the movies that I'm going to be talking about, Death Sentence, is kind of like a revenge, Death Wish kind of uh, kind of flavor to it. So he's done a lot of different things and he is one of the few directors to where I can do a ranking and tell you that every single one of his movies are movies that I like. There's no bad movies on this list. There's no garbage James Wan movies, decent ones and great ones. They're all good. Some of them are awesome. Some of them are the best of all time. This man has created three franchises and who knows Depending on how good Malignant does this weekend and how much fans appreciate it over time, this might turn into a franchise too. This guy is the shit. So it's time to talk about all 10 of his movies from worst to best. If you guys like this video, I've done a couple other direct, uh, director rankings, especially recently. I did Zack Snyder. I did James Gunn. Uh, I even did M. Night Shyamalan after old. So if you like that, I'll put a playlist up here for director rankings. And now it's time to talk about James Wan's rankings. So number 10 for me, and this is the only movie on this list that I would say I'm just kind of indifferent towards. It's, it's a good movie, but I've never had the desire to watch it a second time. And that's Insidious Chapter 2. Now, there's some interesting ideas in this movie. It certainly has some, uh, it has some promise and it has all that James Wan uh, flair as far as the actual directing work, like the camera and the cinematography and the sound design and... You know, all of those movies, all the movies on this list always show promise with James Wan's directing ability. It's just the story with this one that I don't really get into. I'm a big fan of the first Insidious. You'll see that higher on this list. As a follow-up to that movie, I don't really care for the directions that he decided to go. You had that really terrifying image of that woman with the black dress in the first movie, and the origin that they decide to give that character here... Uh, it, it took away a lot of the mystique and a lot of the fright factor for that character for me to where even if you watch the first movie again, it kind of takes a little bit away from that first movie for me, which is never good. Uh, the whole thing about Patrick Wilson's character being possessed by uh, an evil spirit and now they have to get back into the further to get him back out and Elise is a ghost and we're seeing some of the origins of his character when he was a kid when they had to suppress his astral projection abilities. It just... It is not that interesting to me. They covered a lot of this in the first movie. This one kind of felt like a bit of a forced sequel that we didn't necessarily need. Now, I love Insidious Chapter 3, so I'm glad that Insidious turned into a franchise, and I have a lot of, uh, a lot of promise uh, seeing that Patrick Wilson is going to be directing the fifth film. The fourth film was, was okay. But uh, I like the fact it turned into a franchise as a direct sequel to the original movie just doesn't really go in a lot of story directions that I appreciate, but still a creepy movie that gives you a lot of those scares that you liked from the first movie. Number nine is going to be Dead Silence. Now this I actually think is a pretty underrated movie. This is like the most forgotten James Wan movie. I mean he followed up Saw with this. Saw turned into this massive franchise. Dead Silence was just kind of quietly shoved under the rug for some reason. I actually think it's a pretty good movie. I mean, it's kind of going for that B-movie campiness. That's something that we'll talk about again with Malignant. Uh, and I think that does it well. It gives a, a good little ghost story, a good little origins to this evil um, ventriloquist and how it curses this town. And it's, it's part supernatural thriller. It's part, like, doll horror movie. It's part detective story uh, you got Wahlberg in here you got Donnie Wahlberg and the the, the cliches the campy cliches of the hard-nosed detective that he goes for and this just cracked me up I mean every single scene that he's in he's shaving with a little electric shaver as if his facial hair is just growing with every single word that comes out of his mouth uh, and it has a damn good twist at the end you know James Wan is one of those guys unlike M. Night Shyamalan where I feel like when he implements a twist it's to complement his story and more times than not it enhances the movie by the end and this is one of those movies when you get to the end if you haven't had it spoiled for you if you haven't figured it out halfway through the runtime it's a pretty damn cool spot to end this movie on so i would say give it a shot if you have not it's definitely underrated number eight is going to be furious seven furious seven to me does a lot of things right uh, there's a lot of really good action sequences I thought that Jason Statham was a really good addition to this franchise as a villain, even though they retconned that one movie later. And of course, you can't talk about this movie without talking about the death of Paul Walker in the middle of production. A Herculean task 
coming into a franchise, coming into a genre that he had never done before, and then having one of your main stars die and having to piece together the movie after that. I think that the quality of movie that we got at the end of this production is far and away just, just impressive as hell for what James Wan and the crew were able to do despite that huge tragedy of Paul Walker. Um, but the movie does suffer because of that. It's not the movie's fault. I think they did as good of a job as you could have possibly imagined, but there is a lot of spots in this movie where Paul Walker's character looks fake, looks CGI, and it does take me out of the movie every single time. And like, unfortunately, it's just, it's unavoidable. It's something that they walked into this movie having a handicap with. Beyond that, this is where things started to really get stupid. Uh, I mean, I thought that Fast Five was the perfect mix in this franchise of over the top yet grounded. Fast 6 took it a little bit further, Fast 7 just blew the doors off, and then <laughs> since then it's gone even farther and farther, all the way up into space. So I enjoy this movie, it's a shut your brain off and enjoy it action movie, but it's far from my favorite Fast and the Furious movie, and far from my favorite James Wan film. Now my next two movies I debated between a little bit, one of them is certainly much more iconic, while the other one I personally enjoy a little bit more. And uh, it's going to be controversial, but hear me out. Number seven for me is Saw. Fuck this shit, I'm out. I think a lot of people will probably have this at number one. Most James Gunn rank or James Wan rankings, excuse me, will have Saw at number one just because of the iconic nature of that franchise. Saw kicked ass when I first saw it. It blew me away with the twist. It was this cool, new, gritty thing and then the franchise kind of ruined it for me because after Saw 2, they just started to go down and then just blew through the floor with how terrible these movies got. But just speaking strictly on Saw, it's an impressive take for a first time feature film director in James Wan and first time writer in James Wan and Lee Whannell. Uh, I think that those guys are just an awesome team and now they're both awesome directors. And uh, what they were able to do with their own unique idea as basically film students getting this made with a small, small budget, I think that it's really impressive what they were able to do just if this was one singular film. The fact that it turned into one of the biggest horror franchises, and certainly the biggest horror franchise that we've seen in the past, what, 20 years, is awesome. And it, it just shows how much talent these guys had early on and continue to show. I think that Jigsaw as a character is a really interesting character. I think that there's a lot of iconic images in this movie. Billy the Puppet, um, you have a lot of these Saw traps. I think that this movie does a good job at giving you a lot of disturbing vibes and disturbing images without being gratuitous, something that James Wan is always really good at doing, not going just full on gore fest. He gives you the emotions you're supposed to have while being minimalist, and I think he does well with that. Where this movie falls a lot for me is that I cannot stand Carrie Elways in this movie. It's not necessarily his character, it's his acting. I think that he destroys this movie and it's to the point where I can't stand watching it. Every single time it goes back to those two guys in the room, which is the main plot of the movie, he annoys the living fuck out of me. I don't know if that was his personal choice or if James Wan and them were like in support of him being kind of a hammy character and they were going for that campiness. I really don't know, but I cannot stand him in this film. And it literally drops it like two full stars for me because it just grits my teeth every single moment that he's on screen. So for me personally, Despite this being a really popular, really iconic, and very important movie for the horror genre, I don't personally care for it as much as a lot of you guys. I like it, I think it's a good movie, and when I'm in the mood for a Saw movie, this is certainly one of the ones that I will grab, but it is not one of my favorites of all time like a lot of you guys. So it is going to be lower on this list than a lot of you, and it's sitting right here. Which brings me to number six, which is the new dog, Malignant. Now, I watched this a second time last night before I did this ranking, just to kind of make sure that my thoughts were solid, and I felt exactly the same way about it my second viewing that I did with my first viewing. I got a full review up, if you want to check that out, there's a card right up here. I think that this movie is batshit crazy, it's insane, and it's ballsy, and it goes for it with its concept, and I love that. It's so unique and creative, that I love it for that, if nothing else, because you don't get something this unique nowadays. There's been some argument online about it borrowing from some other movies. I've honestly never seen those movies that are getting quoted. So for me personally, this is a big breath of fresh air. 
I think that it is visually awesome. I thought the soundtrack was great. I loved the campy vibe with the visuals and with the house and the old school studio lightning and all of that stuff that they were going for. Uh, and by the end, whenever the twist came, despite the fact that I saw the twist coming, which I want to get into in a second, I thought that the third act totally just, just goes for it and delivers all of the insanity that they were going for with this movie. So this is a very memorable horror film for me. While it's not my favorite of the year, and obviously it's not my favorite James Wan movie, I can see myself rewatching this a lot. Where the movie fell for me, like I already said, I thought that they, for me personally, they gave me a bit too many hints about what was going to be revealed in the third act, and I figured it out pretty early on, about not even halfway through the movie. And that always ruins the movie a little bit for me, because if you can have that shock, like, holy shit, that's what's going on, that makes a movie experience so much better. But if you're sitting there going, I bet this is going to happen, and then you end up being proved right, it always drops your experience just a little bit. So unfortunately, that happened to me. I put a poll up yesterday to kind of get an idea for what, um, for how many people were having that. Um, I basically put a poll up saying, did you see the, the third act twist coming in Malignant? About 25% said they saw it 100%. About 25% said that they, um, they, they were shocked, they had their jaw on the floor. And about 50% said that they kind of had ideas of where it was going, but was still surprised with the ultimate reveal and how they went for it. And that takes me to a tangent, by the way. Let's talk about spoilers, shall we? So I'm somebody that I cannot stand spoilers. I cannot stand when I see YouTubers or even prestigious movie criticism articles by prestigious movie criticism websites and newspapers putting spoilers and headlines, trying to get clicks or YouTubers that just don't give a shit and they just want to say things, whatever. I hate that. I'm somebody that hates spoilers. I'm somebody that doesn't watch trailers most of the time because I want to walk in as fresh and as blind as possible. But some of you guys need to calm the fuck down with what you consider spoilers. If you're somebody that cannot know any little tiny minute detail of a movie without thinking that the movie has been ruined for you, first of all, that's a you problem and it's pretty ridiculous. And second of all, you need to take responsibility for yourself and not watch reviews and not read reviews if you are that person. Because it's impossible to talk about a movie in a review fashion, in a criticism fashion, without getting into some details. Me saying that I saw the twist coming by the end of this movie is not spoiling the fucking movie for you. If you walk into a murder mystery and don't expect that there's going to be a third act reveal of who the killer is, you're a fucking idiot. And if you're somebody that walks into a James Wan horror movie thinking that there's not going to be some surprise reveal eventually in the movie, then you obviously have never seen a James Wan horror film before. So rant over, fuck you, I didn't spoil anything. Now, whew, moving on from that, I really enjoyed this movie. Could have been my favorite horror movie of the year with a few tweaks. Didn't quite get there for me, but I enjoyed the hell out of it and I will rewatch this thing. Number five for me is going to be the original Insidious. Now, this is a movie that really surprised me when it came out. I didn't have any expectations for it. I didn't really even know a whole lot about what the plot was. And James Wan wasn't quite the name that he is nowadays. So even him being the director didn't really draw me in. This movie had been out for at least a month and I just randomly went one day with my little brother to go check it out just to get out of the house for a while. And I was pleasantly surprised at how creepy and how creative and how awesome this movie was. I mean, just that simple tried and true tale about a family in a house that's starting to get tormented by malevolent spirits. We've seen it a thousand times, but James Wan always brings a unique spin to whatever he does. And I love the unique spin they took in Insidious with this whole realm of the further and this astral projection and kind of mixing that into a supernatural haunted house movie. I think that uh, so many characters, like demonic characters in this Insidious franchise are just iconic at this point, like the lipstick demon. And for me, even more so is the, the Black Bride. Uh, I thought that that was just a creepy ass imagery, the way that they zoomed in on it at the beginning of the movie and the way that, you know, the, the final plot reveal at the end with it showing up in the picture flash shot. Uh, I think that there's a lot of really creepy sequences here, like with the little boys dancing, tiptoe through the tulips. And there's just, it's a movie that's just got a really nice pace to it. That's a lot of daytime shots, but still creep you the fuck out. Like any old school nighttime haunted house movie. Characters are great. Acting is great. I mean, you got Patrick Wilson, uh, you've got 
Uh, God bless Lynn Shea. Can I just say that? I mean, this is a woman that has been a godsend to the horror genre. You were going all the way back to just being a teacher in one scene in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, but she has just shown up throughout my entire life and all of these awesome movies and her character here of Elise throughout this franchise, she really is the heartbeat of it. So I love that woman to death. God bless her. Uh, I mean, Rose Byrne, she's always great. And, and even, even though they're the kookiest part of the movie and I think that they bring in campiness when uh, the movie wasn't necessarily going for that, I do like the two little assistants to Elise, one of which is played by Lee Winnell. Um, they're not... They bring the movie down slightly with how goofy they are, but they're still kind of a welcome presence by the time you get to like the third movie and they're still hanging around. It makes you kind of retroactively like them a little bit more. But yeah, I thought this movie was awesome. Uh, I thought it was uh, definitely something that started uh, what could have been an awesome franchise. They've been a little up and down. We'll see how number five goes, but I love Insidious. Number four is gonna be The Conjuring 2. Uh, this is a great sequel. This is what I wished Insidious Chapter 2 would have been as far as this level of quality. It takes a lot of that great execution that we got in the first film and those old school scares, and it brings it over into this new story that a lot of people probably aren't familiar with. And, um, I like the fact that it sticks to this little girl storyline and it kind of, uh, it makes you feel even more vulnerable in this situation, the fact that it's a little girl being tormented. And all the while, even just the ghost of this old man is just chilling you to your bone. When I saw this in the theaters, there was actually a dude in the front seat that in the scene where the old man's face shows up by and he's like, my house, he flew out of the theater and never came back. So I always remember that. Uh, but you mix that in with kind of humanizing the Warrens a little bit more and giving them a little bit more of a personal touch in this movie. Like there's a scene where Patrick Wilson sits down and he just plays an Elvis song and they just make you sit there and just in the middle of a horror movie, just chill out and, and sing along with Elvis along with all these characters and just little cool personal touches like that that James Wan always likes to bring into some of his movies uh, that makes this one stand out a little bit more, makes it a little bit more personal. Then you get the iconic character of Valak that's brought in here, the nun. And despite the fact that uh, the nun's actual movie sucks ass, that character is still an iconic image. That is a horror icon right there based off of one movie. And that was actually a last minute addition. There was like a demon type thing that was gonna be the, the main antagonist and the main malevolent spirit. And then they switched it to something that's a little bit more subtle and is ultimately way, way, way more creepy. Uh, and even little details throughout the movie that you'll notice, like whenever they first start to get into the Warren's house, there's these block letters throughout the house that actually spell out Valak, these cool little details. Uh, the Conjuring 2 is a little bit bloated though. That's where it's not quite as good as the first movie for me. It feels like a little bit long, like they tried to do a little bit too much. Um, I appreciated some of the extra additions with the personal touch, but it could have been a little bit tighter. Number three for me is going to be Aquaman. Uh, again, this is probably much higher on this list than a lot of people's. Even though this movie is popular and it made a lot of money, it seems like the internet doesn't seem to like it as much for some reason. I don't understand why. I think that Aquaman is an awesome movie. I mean, obviously you guys know I love comic book films. I talk about those a lot as well. I love the DC universe and uh, I really like uh, this I like this movie for how action-packed it is as well as how campy it is and I can't really explain why because there's certainly some dumb stupid stuff in this movie but for whatever reason I just embrace it it doesn't really like turn me off it doesn't take me out of the movie I just kind of expect it when you got a fucking octopus doing the drums before a battle I'm like it's an Aquaman movie of course that's gonna happen for some reason it just works for me campiness is a weird subjective thing for Aquaman it works for me but uh, I love Jason Momoa in this role. I love a lot of the side characters here, especially even the villains. I mean, what do you got? Uh, Candyman himself, Yahya Abdul Mateen uh, as the Black Manta. Can't wait to see more out of his character. And then you've got King Orm, once again with Patrick Wilson. Con consistent collaborator with James Wan. He's a great villain. I love his whole journey where he's trying to He's this reluctant king where he doesn't really want his kingdom, but then he kind of has to take it. So he goes on this journey and grows as a person. And whenever he busts through with that gigantic Leviathan or whatever the hell that thing is, that huge sea monster, and he's just like, ah, as he's charging to Atlantis, I'm like, fuck yeah. That sequence is awesome. The trench sequence is awesome. The trench sequence is so fucking cool and metal that they were going to make a whole side project movie based off of that one sequence. Kind of glad they didn't. 
kind of a stupid idea, but that's how awesome that sequence is. Um, doesn't have the best chemistry with um, the ex Miss Johnny Depp. I don't know if I could say her name without getting demonetized at this point. But uh, yeah, they're not necessarily the best together, but they're not terrible. And the soundtrack here and there isn't the best. You know, I'm not a big fan of Pitbull and What's Her Name taking on an, an Asia song. And just, eh, I don't know. It, it could have been a little bit better with the soundtrack. James Wan usually knocks it out of the park. But nonetheless, I enjoy the hell out of this movie. It's one of my favorite DC movies, and it's one of my favorite James Wan films. Number two for me, The Conjuring. Now, this is a damn near perfect horror film to me. Uh, I think that the first time that I watched it, I liked it, but I, I loved it more when I watched it at home for some reason. Usually it's the reverse, but for some reason that being at home in the dark where you can look at doors and windows that can be penetrated and you could be in, in danger very quickly, it made this movie stick a little bit harder. It made it penetrate my soul a little bit more. For some reason in the theaters, I was like, that was good. It was a little bit overhyped, people saying how scary it was. At home, twice as scary. Uh, I, this is a very classic approach to haunted house films. But what I like about it is that The Conjuring is a very character-focused movie. They spend a lot of time focusing on the Warrens and building their characters out. Then they spend a lot of time on this family, all of the daughters, the, the mom and the dad, building all of their characters out. I mean, it's a good 45 minutes or so before these characters even meet and you really even get into like the whole uh, demonology side of things. It's really just fleshing out the Warrens and their whole, their case study and their whole like uh, lore to these characters who are real life people. And then this family kind of slowly tormenting them with some of the most creative scares that I've seen Ever. I mean, the whole thing about the hide and clap where the fucking hands come out next to that woman's face is just brilliant, genius. The whole jump scare where the daughters are running around and one of them's looking up on that armoire and the camera just goes up and you see the witch sitting there on top of the thing. Like, I jumped out of my skin the first time that I saw that. Even stuff towards the end. I mean, just simple practical effects. Like the witch's feet where she's hung and they're hiding underneath the table and then the feet turn around and they start coming towards them. It's like, oh, fuck! Like, just simple stuff like that. It shows you, you never need CGI in a horror movie. You need creativity. And this is one of the most creatively balanced horror films ever. I've never thought that the movie finished as strong as it started. By the time that the mom's fully possessed and trying to, you know, crawl through the house and kill her kids, it's still good at that point, but it's never as, as effective and as creepy as that first to second act where the, the hide and clap and the witch showing up and the pounds on the door, all that stuff to me just works so much better than the exorcism side of things. So that's really the only flaw I have with this is that it starts better than it finishes. Other than that, phenomenal horror movie, one of the best ever. But my number one, and I know this is going to be a very uh, unpopular opinion, but fuck it, Death Sentence. This movie is so awesome to me. Now I love horror. But the subgenre that constantly battles for my favorite is revenge action thrillers. I fucking love these types of movies. I mean, Nobody is still my favorite movie so far this year. And we've had some fantastic movies this year. Death Sentence gives so much style to a revenge action thriller. And it is so brutal and so dark that I love that it goes there. I mean, James Wan, this is when he first started to show that he could really do action sequences. I mean, there's the whole thing where they're up in the parking garage and he's fighting with the guy inside of the car as it's back and about to go over and he fucking seat belts his ass in and jumps out before the car comes out. Even action sequences like the home invasion where he starts taking out like three or four of these fucking guys on the staircase before carnage ensues. This is just an awesome movie. Kevin Bacon is great in the lead role, just a a business guy, a regular Joe, and then he has to turn into this fucking badass mofo to take on these ruthless gangsters. I even thought that Garrett Hedlund was awesome as the, the main villain. He's kind of a chameleon in this movie. I didn't, I didn't even recognize him at first when I saw this. A small role like John Goodman as the father and the gun runner, that's awesome. I mean, there's just so many iconic scenes in here for me personally. This is not one of his more popular movies, but for me, they're iconic. The scene where he goes in to get information about where Billy is and the guy starts talking shit in Spanish and then Kevin Bacon says in Spanish basically like he'll rip his head off and shit down his neck and he's like, oh, you speak Spanish? And then just start fucking nailing his head under the thing. I'm getting pumped. 
just talking about this movie. I love Death Sentence. So, <sighs> I don't know. I don't really have any negatives with this. This is one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, Death Sentence, to me, criminally underrated. Criminally underappreciated. It's one of those movies like Dead Silence that because it's not as iconic as Saw or as big budget as Aquaman or Fast and Furious or as high profile as The Conjuring that it kind of gets forgotten and swept under the rug. This is me telling you that if you haven't seen it yet because you never really hear anything good about it, I'm telling you to watch it. I'm telling you to check this movie out because it's fucking awesome. Well, that's it, guys. That is my James Wan ranking. I'm very curious how people are gonna react in the comment section. I try to say this all the time, guys. Subjectivity of film, these are my favorites. I don't expect them to be your ranking. Just show me your ranking down below and let's discuss it. Don't bitch at me because Saw is number fucking eight or seven, wherever the hell I had it, not number one. Different strokes, different folks. Let's have some fun. Talk down below, guys. Let me know your ranking. We'll discuss it. We'll argue about it respectfully. Like and share this video. Please hit that subscribe button so you can check out all of my further reviews. We've got the Hellraiser franchise review series coming here in a couple of weeks. I'm dead smack in the middle of the Exorcist review series as well. And we've got some more movies coming out in the year of 2021 that you might want to hear about, like uh, Halloween Kills and you know small little independent flicks like that. But hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of that. Thank you guys for watching as always. And remember, opinions are like assholes but that doesn't mean you have to be.